Um, I think despite the theoretical issues, um, Dave Clemens uh, and the folks at Shriners in Philadelphia reported on uh, 819 screws placed both open and thoroscopically with no vascular car complications. So I think it's a theoretical concern, and I think you need to be very careful, but I'm not sure that argues against doing it. Um, and as Viral talked about with the uh, um, growth modulation techniques, as we're starting to get into um, tethers, those are based on screw techniques and, again, are being done thoroscopically. <coughs> And they're, again, they're bicortical. So I think that people are going back to, the pendulum is swinging back. But again, I think it's something you need to be very careful about. And I think if you're gonna do this, you really need to do it under fluoroscopic control so that you can see and make sure how far you are out the other side. Um, whether you can save levels or not, again, I think it's debatable. Um, I think Sook has shown that you can stop short in lots of uh, posterior instrumented curves as long as you get good correction. Um, and I think that uh, uh, Charlie Johnson showed no significant difference in loss of motion in anterior versus posterior spinal fusions above L3. So I'm not sure that that theoretical consideration really matters. Um, Randy Betts reported uh, similar curve correction, anterior and posterior and thoracic curves. Loss of correction was really fairly similar. Uh, kyphosis restoration was much better um, anteriorly, and actually you had to be careful if they were normal kyphotic to start with, you actually could make them hyperkyphotic. Um, their problem in that series was, uh, was rod breakage, but they were only using four rods, so I think most people switched to using bigger rods. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, complication rate was actually fairly similar. Um, and again, I interestingly, we've all gotten into doing these posteriorly, lots of pedicle screws, segmental derotation, and Mike Vitale showed uh, loss of kyphosis with segmental derotation. So we know we're starting with hypokyphotic spines, and then we're making them even more hypo hypokyphotic by our posterior techniques. Um, and I think this is, this is the interesting thing to me. So the people who advocated initially doing anterior surgery, suddenly the pe pendulum has swung and the same results have been interpreted differently. So this study is out of WashU, returned to, and, and they were advocating doing anterior thoracic instrumentation. Um, and in 2000, this was published, returned to 95%, um, PFTs returned to 95% of normal uh, at two years with open anterior. The same group two years later reported their results and said FVC, FEV1 at five years post-op um, were increased in posterior effusions but decreased in anterior effusions. And even though it was only five to 10%, it still was decreased. So theoretically what we're saying is that if you're doing this and we're worried about pulmonary function long-term and we're altering their pulmonary function, is this really the right thing to do? So the question is, can we do the same from posterior now with techniques we have that we used to do anteriorly? And with things like VCRs and wide releases and osteotomies, can we really accomplish the same thing and avoid the anterior procedure and avoid the effect on, on pulmonary function? So this is a 12-year-old girl actually presented at age nine with a 50-degree curve, uh, was seen, told that growing rods were the right treatment. This family disappeared, came back when the girl was 12, 132 degree curve, shortness of breath walking upstairs. So with multiple ponte osteotomies, concave rib osteotomies, then halo traction, then posterior instrumentation and fusion, this is what our results were. So preoperatively, postoperatively after multiple rib osteotomies, wide posterior releases, ponte osteotomies, uh, halo traction for three weeks, 
and then posterior instrumentation with all pedicle screw construct. Um, and I think we probably could not have accomplished anything more from anterior. Okay, yeah, no, that, there you go, the one before. So when I first gave this talk 12 years ago, this was a slide in my talk. Um, and I said, no significant difference in overall outcome, do what works best for you, do what you're the most comfortable with. I think now this is the main thrust of my talk. Um, I think it may be of historical interest only. Um, I think as we get into anterior growth modulation for early onset curves or for younger idiopathic curves, um, I think we're going to get back towards thoroscopic instrumentation, but I think open anterior procedures may become may be becoming a thing of the past. And again, with the, when the people we train are less and less comfortable with them, I think that really makes is an issue as well. Thanks. Questions? Yeah. I believe, uh, in a country like India, we can save the cost by not only going anterior with less number of screws mm -hmm. compared to posterior. Suppose yeah. if you get a curve about 50 degrees in the lumbar spine and or a thoracolumbar junctional area, would it not be easier with a very good result going anterior rather than going for longer posterior fusions? Well, so again, in, to my... In that group, to my mind, the anterior surgery is probably still indicated. In my hands, I think I get better correction. But that said, the cost of screws, a rod, and cages, if you're going to do, use cages to try to maintain lordosis, is probably no different. Now, most people will tell you that they can do a short segment posterior fusion over the same levels with screws at every level so your screw so your cost may not be all that different and get as much correction again in my despite what's out there in the literature in my hands I think I still get more correction in those curves going anteriorly I think you get much more derotational control but you know Shufflebarger is reported doing very wide osteotomies in the lumbar spine taking out the facets completely from the outside and the inside taking out all the ligamentum really freeing things up I still think taking the disc out there gives you more correction and more control but what's out there in the literature doesn't doesn't show that. Yeah. Really shows it, no difference. Is it because the surgeons, young surgeons in the Western world, perhaps even in India as well, they're not exposed to anterior surgeries, and that is the reason why they're going only to posterior? I think that that's very true. I think I think that that's a huge issue. So I think someone like Senthal, who had trained first in India, when they came to came to the states and trained with us, was very comfortable with anterior approaches. But I think somebody like Marios who trained in Greece and probably didn't see a lot of anterior approaches and then came to the States, probably not very comfortable with anterior approaches. And I think that has a lot to do with it. And our own residents and fellows, I mean, I now, I do maybe one or two anterior approaches a year where I used to do one or two a month. So I think it's a huge, huge difference for the people we're training. In we do a lot because of tuberculosis as well. We have a lot of infection. We right. do a lot of anterior surgery. Yeah. In type 1, B and C lengthy curves, What's, your, what's the percentage of progression of the lumbar curve in the follow-up period, if you do anterior surgery for the thoracic? So again, I mean, I haven't done an anterior thoracic instrumentation in 10 years, but I think the results at that time actually showed less decompensation than posterior instrumentation. That was one of the arguments people, the HARM study group were the first ones to report it, and HARMS and Randy Betts were really the ones that re were really pushing it, and they actually reported less decompensation than with posterior instrumentation alone. Recently, I came across two, of, two such cases when somebody else did anterior surgery for thoracic type 1B, then later progressed, the lumbar cover progressed and needed a posterior uh, additional fusion. Yeah. I, I think, you, need, you know, with the thing with, with anterior, if you do anterior, you need to be very careful and make sure you instrument the entire curve. And I other think that's th the key. Yeah. And the other thing is the, what about the kyphosing effect of the anterior surgery in lumbar curves? 
in the sagittal balance so i think that actually you probably get better sagittal balance with anterior as long as you're not kyphotic as long as you're not normal kyphotic to start with because i think if they're normal kyphotic then you make them hyper kyphotic but in the kids who are hypo kyphotic i think you made them normal kyphotic and you got better sagittal balance actually can i have a question uh, regarding the anterior release like uh, I think the trend is towards now uh, more of posterior release right. and getting out with it. Like is that still indication for anti-release like the degree of curve, the amount of curve after which you, you need, definitely need to go for anti-release? So I think that that's really changed. So I, th first of all, I think that taking out lumbar discs really helps you mobilize the spine. I'm less and less convinced that taking out these wedged little, you know, if you have a very, very big curve, the thoracic discs are very wedged. And I'm not sure how much you really get by taking them out. I think taking out the anterior longitudinal ligament helps. But, I mean, our experience certainly has been, so when the kid that I showed, um, I think the concave rib osteotomies are really important. So, and the other thing is, I think you either need to, I, I think traction makes it much safer. So we've gone to really wide posterior releases, ponte osteotomies all along the apex of the curve. And then, so that kid I showed, we did six pontes and did six concave rib osteotomies. You know, we just cut the ribs and let them slide. But you'll see between the pre and the post-op film, the difference that the ribs slide is really tremendous. I think that helps a lot. I think the concave ribs are really, are really hold up your correction. And I think taking and doing an osteotomy on them, I think really helps a lot. In the, okay. in the, uh, the picture you showed uh, in the severe deformity corrected to 30 okay. degrees, the concave rib osteotomies and pontis osteotomy. Uh, was there any role in anterior release or any? Well, so I think that's the question. I mean, I think that's the million dollar question. If you would, you know, there are people who would have said you could have done the, gone anteriorly and then gone posteriorly and done the same thing. You know, I'm, I don't know. I don't know, but that kid, so, see my concern about a kid like that and their pulmonary function is I'm not sure how much, theoretically, by getting her, her spine out of her chest, we should improve her pulmonary function, right? I mean, she, this kid was 12 and was short of breath already walking up and down stairs. So an anterior procedure where you know you may just get back to her pre-op pulmonary function or may never get back to her pre-op pulmonary function, to me that's a real argument to stay out of her chest. While, while an anterior release in a kid like that is easy because the spine, you know, the spine's right there. But I think if you can stay out of her chest in a kid like that, you probably have done her a favor so if you can get the same correction from just behind. So when do you advise anterior release for severe curves? Almost, almost never anymore. Almost never. I try to do as much from behind. VCR, I mean, you know, so my first is ponte osteotomies, plus or minus concave rib osteotomies, traction. If that doesn't correct them, then a VCR. I really try to avoid anterior releases if I can. I, I can't remember the last time I've done an anterior release just for correction. It's been at least five years. Regarding the, uh, after the uh, release, the traction, the halo traction you're giving, like what is the degree of deformity after which you require a definite traction? Because I think certain deformities you can correct without a traction itself. I think, I, so I, I don't think there's definitely, I, I don't think there's definitely a right and a wrong answer. I think if the curves are very stiff, then I think, so that kid, 130 degree curve only bent out to 110 degrees on bending and traction films. So uh, stiff curves, I think curves where you would have thought about doing anterior release because they're stiff, I think halo traction makes things safer. And you know, the evidence is mixed about how much more correction it gives you. There's some things in the literature that show you your correction is better. We actually published a paper a few years back from Shriners in Chicago showing that our correction was never better than our traction films, even with the halo. I think it probably makes, in these bigger curves, I think it makes things safer because you're getting gradual correction. But I'm not sure how much it really helps you with your correction when you look at it critically. Does it also have an influence on the uh, uh, neurological deficit, post-op neural yeah, well, deficit? I think probably I think the traction the can help reduce yeah. that incidence. Yeah. yeah, I think traction definitely introduced. So we put them in traction, gradual, we, we start low and try to get them up to somewhere between a third and half of body weight. We're very careful about monitoring their neurologic status while they're in traction. And then we keep the traction on during surgery. 
Um, obviously, you're very careful with our neurologic monitoring, but I think it, I think it helps decrease the incidence of neurologic injury in these really big stiff curves. Okay. Any, any more questions? Any more questions? Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, next is another debatable topic, very controversial, the selection of fusion levels, correction methods and uh, thoracic, thoracic pedicle screw insertion by Sindhil. you know and TA definitely has a role and like <coughs> you rightly said the old timers who are very used to NTAs find it very very easy and I think for the uh, Lenke type 5 Lenke type 5 is definitely a much better option uh, curves and also we we do a lot of these stiff curves 100 degree 120 degree curves and I even there I, I use uh, anterior releases anterior releases help you a lot in the sense when you release them anteriorly and then and I, I, I tend to stage them and then go posteriorly my osteotomies get lessened so a case 120-130 degree curve which would need a asymmetrical osteotomy medical subtraction or a VCR becomes just ponties and and I agree with you a me medial uh, at the apex two, two three uh, ribs have to be sort of cut so that help, that does make a difference if you have to avoid a VCR by doing an anterior release it's, it's much worse VCR is much more uh, uh, sort of uh, the, much more dangerous and you know mobility just goes up it bleeds more so just just if by, by anterior releases and pontis osteotomy at the back you can avoid some more difficult osteotomies behind after it doing a good anterior work would give very good results in these rigid, late presented scoliotic kids. That's what I feel. And especially the very few youngsters here, there's no way you can practice spine surgery in India if you are not an anterior surgeon. We have huge amount of infection and we have to be very good anterior surgeons. Anybody can be a posterior surgeon. And it's not that difficult. These approaches are so easy to do. All you have to do is to get yourself trained and see somebody and assist them for a few months and you can do it. It's a very important point for us. Put cages from behind. Yes. I mean, not a big deal. How do we do an osteotomy? You have to have a vertebral resection. It's not that we shouldn't be doing these procedures from behind or we should not be doing these resections and the osteotomies, which we have to do, especially. But to make you're making things more complicated. <coughs> and in spine surgery or any form of surgery, doing things from front and back is much safer option and easier option. See, it depends on which pathology we're dealing with. I mean, all of us have only anterior in infections and got away with fantastic results. Depends on what pathology, what patient, etc. So, yes, much might be said on both sides, but it's important that the surgeon today should never, ever forget the anterior approach because a lot much more to gain doing anterior surgeries and combining them with posterior surgeries is a very good, safe, excellent option. This is my opinion and my experience in the last three decades. Yeah. The next talk on thoracic pedicle screws and correction of techniques in deformity surgeries. Posterior spinal surgery started, by, I mean, instrumentation started in 1953, has various phases from Warrington rods to when Camley introduced the screws. There was a change in the spinal deformity correction from a two-planar correction to a three-planar correction. And a lot of contributions has been done by Dr. Professor Sook and Lenke. 
the advantage of posterior instrumentation is that it doesn't violate the spinal canal until we do a violate it. Three column fixation, it's especially in more rigid curves and it's stable during manipulation of the curves. It improves both the coronal and axial plane correction. With the osteotomies and with the screw inside, it also causes a, a lot of derotation we can able to do and uh, allows apical derotation and easier to assemble the implants and eliminates the need for costoplasty in certain kids. However, there is a steep learning curve. There are a lot of issues that uh, makes a surgeon like this, makes a surgeon think about uh, using a thoracic pedicle screw. So the techniques to eight thoracic pedicle screws are freehand technique, a funnel technique, you can use a KOI pilot, a fluoroscopy to AP and lateral, an intraoperative CT. There is a long list of usage of doing a technique. But the most common and most commonly practiced and most taught about is the freehand technique. The freehand technique uses the, the superior facet rule where all no screws start medial to the midpoint of the superior facet. The step one to the an ideal screw fixation in any surgical procedure is a complete exposure, a bloodless complete exposure of the bony anatomy up to the transverse process. These are the starting points. These are this it was taken from Kim and Linky's article in nine, in 2002. So Starting from the me just lateral to the medial midpoint of the superior facet, you start the screw. The, the side on the B is where you shouldn't start. The B point is where you shouldn't start. A is where you have to start. And uh, the cephalocaudal positions depends upon the level of the screws and the level of the vertebral bodies. Once you start the identifying the entry point, then you use a gear shift pointing outwards up to the level you will reach the pedicle which is roughly about 20 millimeters and then turn around your gear shift and then advance it forward up to the level of the vertebral body. Then most important is the pedicle palpation. I would say that we need to give a lot of time to do for the pedicle palpation because we need to do all the walls thoroughly because as you all know like feel is always better rather than I mean when you touch it is better than when you see it or hear it, <laughs> okay? So I think palpation plays a major role in um, ascertaining the bony landmarks that the pedicle is not violated. And then mark the length of the screw. We used to measure the screws every time and uh, confirm the level. I mean, even though the gear shift most of the times has a measurement device in it, we do measure it by the age old technique of clipping the uh, a probe and then measuring it by visual means. Then tapping, you follow the same track and then you need to repalpate it so that you don't tap somewhere else. And then the screw is gradually placed. This is how it is usually done. So first is outward shift, then the gear shift goes inside. Then you palpate the walls of the pedicle and then insert the tap, repalpate it again and then screw it in. So confirmation of the screw placement is most often done either by spinal monitoring. I mean, we, there are a lot of centers where spinal monitoring has been used. And in India, like we have, do have, I can probably point out fingers which centers have spinal neuromonitoring. Most of the curves, I mean, scoliosis surgery, spine deformity surgeries are done without a spinal neuromonitoring. And then the most important thing is we have a f intraoperative fluoro, which helps us to look at the screws. The harmonious placement of the screws, the screws that has not crossed beyond the midline, helps us identify that the screws has not been violated or not in the canal. Still, I re-emphasize that feel of the pedicle probe, cure it and drill bit down the pedicle body, gives us an absolute confirmation of the interosseous placement. Starting point, orientation, and trajectory, and feel are most important. Feel for everything. So this is the harmonious placement of the screw. If you look at the screw eight, it looks more towards the medial aspect. So there is a chance that it can get violated. So in that case, what I do is I take the screw out and repalpate the bony walls and make sure that it is not violating it. So these are uh, CT scan gradings to look at for um, the violation of the pedicle screws. There was uh, a paper by Lenke in 2002, which was presented in SRS, which showed uh, when the surgeon started to, I mean, basically it was Lenke's paper, when he started to Screw it, there were a lot of breakthroughs through the pedicle and as he ascended more than like 
as experience counts, the number of breakthroughs were less. And we should be, uh, be aware that anterior to the vertebral body, especially at this level, we look have uh, the most important structures we shouldn't screw or take a biopsy of it. The other technique is the funnel technique, which is commonly done, which is we cure the entire or nibble out the entire process of the transverse process at the junction and then feel directly the pedicle. You can use a like a pedicle probe. When you press the probe over the bone, it usually goes through the pedicular hole and then it gives you a direct impact of the pedicle hole. Coming to correction techniques, patient positioning is more important. There are a lot of correction techniques like compression, distraction, anterior translation, posterior translation, lateral, cantilever, rod rotation. None of it is individually followed. Most of it is followed all around. I mean, in a surgical case, we do multiple techniques at the same time. And it's very hard to point out which technique is more preferable than the others. As there was a lot of discussion about halogravity traction, osteotomies, whether to go anteriorly or posteriorly, it's still a debate, but it is based on individual cases. This is a type on your curve. The patient had a po anti, I mean, posterior, he had a, a good correction of 80, I mean, on bending films, if you see, it corrects to 35 degrees. And then we did a po posterior fusion. This is a, the video showing how a derotation can take place. Like what you do is, as we, as Dr. Sturm discussed in the morning for uh, derotating the spine on a cast, we do the same thing intraoperatively. So this is like segmental derotation where we have the apex, we hold the screw with the reducers and then try to derotate it in the apex of the curve. So when you look at the prior to concave rod placement, the screws are placed, the clear bony anatomy is seen, and then the osteotomies are done when you look at this, and the screws are applied. Then you tend to place the reducers on the concave side and then start reducing gradually. This post, uh, pre and post reduction, I mean, derotation. And when you see, you look at your intraoperative images, you clearly see that when you look at the screws of the apex, you, you see that the derotation has actually happened when you do an osteotomy. And then you, you can feel the difference between the position of the screws pre and post derotation. This other curve with a, a type 6C. So this patient underwent a posterior uh, fusion. There is no anterior release or anything. But this in, involved a multiple, as I said, it involves multiple correction techniques. It does not only involve a vertebral derotation or a segmental derotation. So it involves like compression, distraction. Everything is followed to bring the spine straight. So this is one of the examples where I uh, showed you the concave rib osteotomies are done. When you see that, this is like a one-year-old uh, after surgery where you see that the concave rib reformations. Thank you. So questions, please. If it's a very flexible curve, then I do it with the single rod. But if it has a rigid curve, one of the curves is very rigid and doesn't correct more than 50 percent, then we use top. One basic question: like you said, two, uh, two fun technique and the uh, freehand. yeah freehand technique. Like, which do you think is more safer? I still do think the freehand is better as you get experience. And the funnel technique maybe, maybe you can see so you, you can. No, what is the disadvantage of funnel the technique like compared to the freehand technique? What is it? Sir? What do you think is the When you do the thing, you lose the feel like. But if you are trained in the freehand technique, I still feel that freehand technique is far easier than the funnel technique. Okay. Don't you think like uh, it's just the, uh, in fact, the. Uh, it's, a, we, we, it's uh, naturally guiding through if you're going, going by the funnel technique rather than uh, it, it doesn't matter whether you lose the anatomical landmark or not. Because it easily just goes into the pedicle as such, you know. You're very safe in it. That's what I feel. Example, if the patient is like, who has any other patient, so already.
does it have any any the you are out most of the bone and then direct to the vertebral body body is mostly here Is there any preferred technique that you would uh, that you would suggest for a type C pedicle? Most often when you do that, it goes and in and out in technique without your knowledge itself. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Dr. Sindel. So here is the uh, you see a member. So the of classification after you know, doing fellowship member what with it a little bit easier. No. I think uh, at the end of the day, what you want fusion what you see in terms of three, four, five, and this way of look application. So I'm going to focus my on which is by far common and see are broken with a double curve. So what length are uh, curve um, a lanky one is the same curve and So, a sample sacrum or one pedicle vertical and middle the pedicle wall is a should say length. B is pedicle where, where goes through the pedicle and to make in the pedicle this one goes through the pedicle, apex of the lump point. The lumbar touch so it is been and sometimes you can do this you but just by looking at the but which would which we will see uh, can see length one and not uh, lanky three so lanky three is the curve major it is a What do you mean by structural curve? Which band is structural? It, it does not, not important. So, lanky one curve always major and structural, but lumbar curve is structural. In lanky five, the lumbar curve is structural. So, this is probably the way 
by language classification. That's how I learned. I don't, I don't know if a better way to simplify learn remember things. It's a sixth major means all one C. So so on the bending film the six degrees but the lump depends on degrees natural. So it is a single key one C at the center Okay, the next one. 